Hey, Vlad here, devinsideview.com. Welcome to another video. In the previous video, we talked about managing your environment variables with a tool called Dear ENV, which we're gonna use today quite a bit. So if you haven't seen it, you might wanna check it out. Today, we're going to start a mini playlist, only two videos, and we're gonna talk about configuring your applications with a prominent configuration library, at least in the Scala ecosystem, called TypeSafe or Lightband Config. Let's get right to it. As in most of my videos, I'm using an Ubuntu 18.04 virtual machine and I'm using Windows as a host, which has a feature called virtual desktops, which gives me shortcuts that allow me to switch between Windows like this and back to Ubuntu like that. All right, now there will be a lot of talking in this video because even though I could show you in just a couple of minutes how to load a config and read a couple of values out of it, I have seen it being done wrong way too many times. So as in most of my videos, we're gonna take things slow and I'm gonna show you how I usually configure my own applications. There are three aspects that we need to talk about and to Today we're going to talk only about one of them, which is how to load your config or the way I like to phrase it, where do the values come from? And in the next video, we will talk in depth about how to read the values out of this intermediate representation, out of this loaded config, and also about the format in which to store your config, which is usually something that gets people excited. But the most important part is where do these values come from? And so we're gonna start with a thing called the 12 factor app. There is a popular application platform called Heroku, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And if not, it's essentially a managed cloud you can deploy your applications to. Now, Heroku has been around since 2007 and its employees clearly have a lot of experience when it comes to DevOps. And so what they did is they put together a nice little website where they give you a template for the quote unquote, perfect software app from the DevOps perspective, of course. In fact, we're gonna go there right now. I already have it open in my browser in Windows. So it's a nice little app and it's divided into 12 chapters, which is why it's called the 12 factor app. And if you scroll down a little bit, you're gonna see all of the chapters. And today we're only gonna talk about code base and config dependencies is one of those things that is usually being done right on the JVM. So we're not gonna talk about them. The whole website is gonna take you only half an hour to go through, so you should definitely check it out. So you see a little summary underneath and this is pretty much everything that we need to know. So code base means that it's basically tracked in revision control, which basically means Git these days, uh, but it also has many deploys. So we're going to click inside in just a second and see exactly how they define the word deploy. A config, the most important part about config is that it is not stored in files. It is actually stored in environment, which is environment variables, which is exactly why the previous video was all about dear ENV and the environment variables. So let's click into code base. As you can see, the entire chapter is only a couple of paragraphs long, and all we need is this one over here, and I'm gonna read it out for you. There's only one code base per app, but there will be many deploys of the app. A deploy is a running instance of the app. This is typically a production site and one or more staging sites. Additionally, and this part is very important, every developer has a copy of the app running in their local development environment, each of which also qualifies as a deploy. So every time you're sitting inside of your SPT or if you're using Bloop, every time you're running your application, this is technically a deploy. Now we're gonna click next and this is the one about the dependencies, so we're gonna skip that. This one is also only a couple of paragraphs long, and in fact, we're gonna read out the most of it because this is very, very important. So it basically says store config in the environment, right? This is the entire premise. And apps config is everything that is likely to vary between deploys, and this is probably the most important point. If it doesn't vary, you might as well hard code it. Staging, production, development, environment, etc. This includes resource handles to the database, memcache and other baking services, credentials to external services such as Amazon S3 or Twitter, per deploy values such as the canonical host name for the deploy. Now, what they're trying to do here is to give you a crystal clear definition. So they're being very, very strict. It says over here, apps sometimes store config as constants in the code. This is a violation of 12 factor, which requires strict separation of config from code. Config varies substantially across deploys, code does not. And this is exactly what I meant. If it doesn't vary, you might as well hard code it. A litmus test for whether an app has all config correctly factored out of the code is whether the code base could be made open source at any moment without compromising any credentials. Note that this definition of config does not include internal application config, such as config routes RB in Rails, or how code modules are connected in Spring. This type of config does not vary between deploys, and so is the best done in the code. And this is one of the problems that we're going to talk about today, because the library that we're going to talk about today is 
very very convenient it's very very good and it's very very powerful so what a lot of people end up doing is they end up putting everything in there they continue to make their point another approach to config is the use of config files which are not checked into revision control such as config database yaml in rails this is a huge improvement over using constants which are checked into the code repo but it still has a weakness it's easy to mistakenly check in, check in a config file to the repo there is a tendency for config files to be scattered about in different places and different formats which is by the way one of the things that the config library is doing very well uh, they basically unite the whole thing you can have your entire config in one file and in one format making it hard to see and manage all the config in one place further these formats tend to be language or framework specific this is again one of the things you know this config library that we're going to talk about today it is jvm specific and here is the main point of the article the 12 factor app stores config in environment variables often shortened to env vars or env which is again why i made the previous video in env vars are easy to change between deploys without changing any code unlike config files there is little chance for them being checked into the code repo accidentally this is because usually you know when you have a uh, uh, well, not really Docker, but, you know, if you deploy something to AWS, you know, they will have a UI for your environment variables or, you know, they will have a, you know, a CLI or something, whatever, but you're not going to store it in, in plain files. And unlike custom config files or other config mechanisms, such as Java system properties, they are a language and OS agnostic standard, right? Because your deploy people, especially if you have, uh, you know, a huge company, you know, they will, they will be deploying a bunch of different applications with different, different stacks. So uh, not everything is Java. So, uh, yeah, but environment variables work for everything. Another aspect of config management is grouping. Sometimes apps batch config into named groups, often called environments, named after specific deploys, just such as the development test and production environments in Rails. This method does not scale cleanly. As more deploys of the app are created, new environment names are necessary, such as staging or QA. As a project grows further, developers may add their own special environments like Joe's staging, and believe it or not, I have seen so much of this, resulting in a combinatorial explosion of config which makes managing deploys of the app very brittle. In a 12-factor app, ENV vars are granular controls, each fully orthogonal to other ENV vars. They're never grouped together as environments, but instead are independently managed for each deploy. This is a model that scales up smoothly as the app naturally expands into more deploys over its lifetime. All right, now, if you have been exposed to configuration libraries like the TypeSafe config library, which this video is about, then you might be shocked about the strictness of these recommendations. So let's talk about it a little bit. Firstly, these rules and and the entire 12 factor app methodology mostly targets microservices so for instance if you're a library author i believe it's perfectly reasonable to have a configuration file with all of your default values and not only is it perfectly reasonable to include it in your version control system but it should also be a part of your jar and in case you're new here this is mostly a scala channel so we're mostly targeting the jvm over here but still all of what i just said assumes that your users will be able to override the defaults with another config file or even better environment variables another thing when it comes to apps is i believe it is perfectly reasonable to have sensible defaults for the local database or the local i don't know redis cache or whatever because you don't want the new devs to mess around with the environment variables on their first day again no matter what you're using i totally agree that it should be overridable with environment variables so if you're going for uh, well, not hard-coded values, but if you're going for configuration files or whatever, then it should still be possible to override all of that stuff with environment variables, which is possible with the config library that we're talking about today, and we're going to see this by the end of the video. All right, now let's finally start talking about how this is actually done. We already learned about environment variables in the previous video. Today, we're also going to learn about the thing called system properties, which are very similar to environment variables, but they are a JVM-specific concept, right? So outside of the JVM, nothing understands them, but inside of the JVM, they're as powerful as the environment variables. So let's start by creating a playground project and load a couple of environment variables and a couple of system properties, and then switch to the config library and do exactly the same with the config library. Let me switch back to my VM. So I'm going to open my terminal. I'm going to go into my dev folder, which is currently empty. And as in most of my videos, I'm going to use one of my templates. I'm just going to call the project config playground and the organization is going to become dev inside you and the package is just going to be dev inside you like this and we're going to open config playground with visual studio code 
Now, if you have seen my previous videos, then you know that this is the template that I usually use to set up all of my projects. And so when I'm recording tutorials, I will change a couple of things. I'm going to go into the build file and I'm basically going to, no, sorry, not now. And I'm basically going to uh, just comment out in these two lines, right? Because I don't need them when I'm recording tutorials. This is all that we need for now. Now I can actually go and import the build built and um, yeah as always we're using the latest version at the moment this is Scala 2.13.1 this is SBT 137 and it just has a tiny main file over here which just prints out hello world now since we're going to be dealing with environment variables and system properties a lot uh, oftentimes we will need to uh, kill SBT and you know go into the folder you know use the DNV which we talked about in the previous video to reload the environment variables so we're going to use bloop a lot today we're going to use SBT a little bit as well because there are quite some differences in fact there are a couple of bugs in both in bloop and um, well, in SBT, it's not actually a bug, but it's a limitation. But in any case, so we're going to use uh, Bloop a lot today. And if you don't know what Bloop is, uh, watch my video about it. This is essentially a build server. It just sits there. It's already installed. It just waits for me to throw projects at it. So one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to uh, go into my terminal and uh, we're going to type in DI. And if you've seen my previous video, then you know my um, that I have an alias called DI which uh, does this, right? So it creates a file called .envrc and puts inside the .env, which means that it will load stuff from the .env file, right? So it will also create the file called env, .env and it will also allow it, allow it, okay? So I type in di, two files will appear over here so we can go inside and we can go, in fact, I'm gonna do this a bit later. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to load variable. In fact, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to run run this, okay? Bloop run config playground, okay? Like this, so we see our hello world. Uh, maybe we can have a couple of less like this, all right? We see our hello world, all right? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to print out, we're going to print out system.getenv and we're going to say just key one like this and if we run this you know this is a classical java api if it's not there it's going to return a null so let's actually go and create it let's go into env and let's do something like key one equals usually you should avoid white spaces white spaces around uh, the equal sign but in this case i know that it's going to work it actually might be a dear env feature i'm actually not sure all right so we're going to save well value one from dot env like this let me save the file let me run it again. It's not going to see it because I still need to reload the folder. As you have seen, now the folder has been reloaded. Now the key is there. I can run it again. And now we should see value one from .env. All right, now let me start creating some more space. We're going to play a lot with the .env file and also with the property files that we will introduce in just a couple of seconds. Let me remove the minimap like this. Okay, let me create some more space. This should be enough. All right, now the way you load the system properties is very, very similar. You just say get property instead. And you know, it's a convention to use uh, the small letters. So we're gonna do key one like this. And as before, it's going to be null because it's not there. Now, there are many ways to pass in properties and, you know, to the JVM uh, program. So I'm going to show you a couple, but most of the times we're just going to pass them uh, as flags. So we need uh, two dashes or hyphens. I sometimes say hyphen, sometimes I say dash. We need a hyphen J or dash J. Then we need hyphen D which stands for properties for some reason. I actually have no idea why property, or why um, uh, why the hyphen D is used, all right? And then without any spaces or anything, you just say key one, and then the equal sign, again, no, no spaces. And then you have your quotes, and then you do whatever you want inside of them. Okay, so we're gonna say value one from system.properties, like this, all right? And I got some nice syntax highlighting because I'm using ZSH. Now, let me actually do the same thing with SBT. Like most of the times we're going to use bloop but a couple of things we're going to do with SBT. In fact, let me actually do this so that I can just go over here uh, like this and remove all of that. And I can just do SBT run like this. Okay, so with SBT, you actually can skip the hyphen J. Uh, it would work actually if you just do SBT run, you know, hyphen D. Okay, first time it's gonna take forever for SPT to load, which is again, one of the reasons why we're using uh, Bloop today, okay? But once it finally loads, it's gonna work exactly the same. I'm gonna show you exactly the same thing without the half and J, like this. All right, let's actually go back to Bloop like this, 
All right. In fact, for this one, I'm actually going to say hyphen W for watch, and I believe it needs to be here because, like, when you when you're passing parameters, like uh, after this thing, uh, the only thing that should come are, are the parameters. Okay. So let's watch the folder, and I'm also going to show you the Scala API. So in Scala, in Scala dot util there is an object called properties and it has a bunch of functions like for example this one in b or none and we're going to do key one key one like this let me duplicate this none there's uh, also this one uh, which i can do prop prop or none like this and we're going to use key one like this let's run these two all right, so these ones also work. You know, they're basically more idiomatic um, Scala API, they return options. Um, you also have a bunch of system properties that you're not specifying. They're sort of always there by default. So uh, we can do something like system dot uh, get property, or in fact, let's actually, um, no, let's, let's do this one. So let's do a system property and you can do something like user dot home. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you that the Scala API uh, has a lot of them hard coded, right? So, for example, you can do Scala util dot properties, and they can just do dot u, for example, and you see you have user dear, user home, user name. So let's do user home. It's basically going to do exactly the same thing behind behind the scenes. Uh, one of the cool things, for example, is the uh, version number string. Right, so you have the version number string, which gives you the Scala version. So it should print out 213.1 over here, which is kind of cool. Now, it is also possible to load properties from files. I believe people sometimes differentiate between the system properties and you know the properties that are loaded from files. For this, we need to go into source main resources. Source main, it doesn't exist. So we're going to say new file, uh, resources slash dot properties, like this. All right, so this file, we're gonna put it over here like this. All right, let me create more space again. Okay, we're gonna put something similar in there. We're gonna say key one equals value one from dot properties. Notice that I'm not using double quotes and this is totally on purpose. In fact, I'm gonna show you the difference in just a second. All right, let's actually remove these. We actually don't need them anymore. So the API, you know, classical uh, Java API, we're going to do Java util dot properties equals. Okay. So it's mutable stuff, mutable properties. We're going to create an object Java dot util dot properties. And then we need to mutate it. And for that, we're going to create a stream, which is going to be a Java dot IO input stream like this. And we're going to go to get class, get class loader, get resource no not this one get resource as stream and we're just going to say dot properties like this let me scroll down a little bit and create more space and we're going to do mutable properties dot load stream right so we're essentially mutating this object you know classical java api and then by the end we're going to return the mutable properties like this okay and now we're going to go down and we're going to say a print line and we're going to go properties dot get property key one like this okay so before we were doing system dot get property now we're going to this object and we're doing get property in fact let me actually go up and remove these two so that we're confused a little bit less and there we go okay so we're loading a value from the environment variables we're loading a value from system dot properties and we're also loading the value from dot properties and also note that if i put quotes over here like this and we save the file again so that it reruns come on rerun there we go we actually see quotes as part of the string so when you're dealing with property files don't include quotes but after this video you're probably not going to deal with uh, property files anyway one of the important things to notice and this is going to become important in just a couple of minutes is that this key one does not collide with this key one right so the values are different right it is going to be a bit different for the for the for the config library all right so the next thing that i'm going to show you is that there is a well let's actually call it bug so if we do exactly the same thing with sbt okay so if i go into sbt right so it's exactly the same thing right we can even use hyphen j hyphen j we're going to see that it, it should fail it should throw exception uh, at least in the preparation uh, of this video it actually uh, throw an exception and it throws an exception because uh, for some reason it doesn't like the fact that this file does not have a name okay Come on, compile. There we go. We see an exception. So as soon as we do something like uh, config.properties and we actually go and rename this file, rename this file, 
uh, config.properties, it's going to work exactly the same as it worked for uh, Bloop. I'm gonna wait a couple of seconds. I'm gonna cut this out of the video. We're gonna we're gonna restart SBT and Bloop um, many times. So uh, sometimes I'm going to cut out these things from the video. Okay, compiling one Scala source. It should take just a couple of seconds, and there we go. Now it works exactly the same. I just didn't like the fact that the properties file didn't have a name. Since we need to reload the project so many times, I'm trying to avoid the amount of times we're using SBT. But for now, let me show you a couple of other places where you can specify the properties. So uh, there is a file called SBT ops, and you can also create a file called JVM ops dot JVM not HVM, JVM, A O P T S. Don't forget the T. All right. So what you can do in here is you can go and say have in the key, key one equals. And for some reason, even with double quotes or single quotes or whatever, you cannot have spaces over here, right? So it only accepts single key values. So for example, we do the single key values, like single word values. Okay. So if you do something like this, then we can actually go and run this. In fact, let me run it once um, with this, so to say, override, and then once once more uh, without without the override. Okay, so uh, let's see which one has a higher precedence. All right, so as you can see, everything that you're passing on the uh, on the command line has actually higher precedence. So if we remove all of that, and if we just say sbt run, then we should see this one, okay? And in the meantime, because I don't wanna waste your time, I'm also going to copy that, and I'm gonna go to .sbt ops, uh, which, wh where I have a couple of defaults, and I'm gonna do this over here. And this is something that I forgot to say, you're not allowed to use hyphen j over here. Over here, it again, it doesn't matter. You can do hyphen j, and you can do it without hyphen j. So I'm gonna do as bt ops over here. So as you can see, we have J JVM ops over here. As soon as we have dot sbt ops, it will actually have higher precedence, right? So it's uh, it's basically uh, you know um, JVM ops, sbt ops, and then you know whatever you pass um, in 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 the terminal. Okay. So we see sbt ops. It has higher precedence. Again, only single word values work. For some reason, if you do start doing like quotes here and spaces, it's not going to work. Now the problem with these is that Bloop doesn't see any of them, right? So if we just say Bloop run uh, config playground, then you're not going to see them, right? You see, you see null. And this is also the reason why we're not going to discuss them any further. In fact, I'm going to remove them just so that we don't get confused. In fact, I'm going to remove the entire .jvm ops file like this. There we go. Let me close that one. Let me close that one. Uh, let's keep running Bloop the same way as we did before with the, uh, yeah, yeah, this one. This one is good. All right. So we have our ENV system properties and the properties from file. In fact, we should probably rename this to config.properties like this. All right. Let's save the file. For some reason, I have to save the file twice so that it reruns. Okay, so we have one from system properties, one from config properties, and one from .env. All right, now let's start talking about the config library, which is called the Lightband config, and it's called like this because the, um, the company that is back in Scala is called Lightband, and in the past, it used to be called TypeSafe. So if you search for TypeSafe config, you're still gonna find it, it's just that the organization on GitHub is now called Lightband, uh, but the Maven artifact is still TypeSafe. Not a big deal. All right. Uh, by the way, there are other configurations library even in the Scala ecosystem. So not only Java, Java obviously have, has their own things, but even Scala has more of them. Uh, but this is arguably the most prominent one, which is why I'm making a video about it. So from now on, I'm going to refer to this library simply as the config library. And it has been around since 2012, which is quite a long time. Right now I'm recording this at the beginning of 2020, which means it's eight years. And it did a couple of really interesting things. The first thing it, it, it does for you is it unites environment variables, property uh, ver files, other configuration files, and it can load them from all over the place. It can load them from strings. It can load them from, from the class path. It can even load them from URLs and from files, obviously. So it's pretty much like a Swiss army knife of config loading, which sounds really cool on paper, but as most powerful tools, there are way too many ways to uh, use it improperly, let's say. Another thing it does for you, it allows you to specify your configuration in JSON and also in a super set of JSON called HOCON, which is humanly optimized, which is also the reason why it is called H-O-C-O-N, which is an abbreviation for humanly optimized config object notation. Now, pretty much everyone agrees that this is a really nice configuration format. It's very human friendly and it became sort of a de facto standard in the Scala ecosystem, which is an important fact because when this library was created, 
Scala JS did not exist yet. And so one of the decisions that was made back in the day was to write it in Java because Lightband has customers both in Java and in Scala, which means that you cannot use this library in Scala JS. However, you can use the Hoklon standard because there are other libraries, other implementations that know how to read this library. We're going to stick to the JVM though, uh, but it's good to know that, you know, for Scala JS, there are, all, there are also solutions out there. Now, Hoklon is going to be the topic of the next video today we're only concerned with how are we going to load the values from multiple pla places so let's add it to the class path real quick let's go to our build like this let's go down a little bit we have our main dependencies over here and we're just going to say com.typesafe even though the company was renamed the maven coordinates stay the same uh, note that we're using only one um, I'm going to call it module assemble uh, because this is a Java library, right? It's called config in the latest version, at least at the moment of recording is 1.4.0 and the build has changed. Yes, please import the changes. All right. So we're going to go to our main and we're going to leave this for just a couple of seconds and we're going to do exactly the same thing uh, with the config library. So we're just going to import com.typesafe.config dot underscore. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. We're going to create a config of type config which is going to be just config config factory dot load and we're going to go and print out print out config dot get string key one like this all right let's open the terminal again class not found la 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 there we go uh what's wrong Mm -hmm. No configuration setting found for key one. All right, now I found out what was happening in it. I was actually surprised because I spent quite a bit of time preparing this video. And um, basically, uh, if you want the uh, type safe config library to load environment variables, you also need to add another flag. I actually did not know that you need to add another flag. It's just that during the preparation for my video, I added that flag at a later point in time. It still somehow kind of worked. In fact, I wanted to show you this flag a bit later in the video, but hey, all right. So this flag has been added later to the TypeSafe config library. In fact, it was added somewhere in the, um, in the middle of 2019, so only like half a year ago. Okay, so if we run exactly the same pro uh, program with another flag, half and J, uh, happen D. Okay, so this is a system property. Uh, if we do config dot override with env vars equals true. Uh, I really did not know that we actually need this flag. Okay, I wanted to show you this flag for a different reason, right? But if you have this flag, then it's gonna work. So pretend like this didn't happen. We're gonna get back to this flag a bit later in the video. All right. So now let's also go and print out key one like this all right so let's go and do uh do that again all right and we see over here system properties great one of the things you need to know about the config library is that they uh, made a conscious decision right so it's baked into the philosophy of this library is that the values for those keys and you know the keys themselves they're mandatory and so if you request a key that does not exist it will throw an exception again this is de this is by design this is on purpose in fact let's actually go and add the add the watch flag as well like this all right so it throws an exception if we scroll down the message should be very very descriptive it says merge of env variables override system properties uh basically failed and no configuration setting setting found for for key two let's actually remove the key two all right now you can also uh load properties right so you just do val properties which is also a config config like this equals config factory that load config dot properties all right notice that uh this uh load flag uh what is happening properties is already defined oh yeah uh let's call it properties too properties too uh notice that this load um function is overloaded and has you know it has many many um uh, many variations this particular one uh loads files from from the class path okay but now we can go and say print line properties properties to dot get string and we're going to get the key one and if i did everything right the print line should look a little bit different so what happened over here is that there was some merging of the values going on right so as i already mentioned uh, you know it, it comes with you know it, it unites environment variables system properties and uh, 
uh, and the uh, you know the properties in, in your uh, in basically your configuration now this merging of the files is one of the primary reasons why I decided to make this video because in my humble opinion it's equivalent to the implicit resolution rules which pretty much everybody hates right so it's very not obvious where the values come from in fact if we go to the website I already have it prepared it's over here scroll down a little bit and if we find um, where is it it's probably over here in standard behavior yes so if you didn't config factory load and again there are many overloads there are many ways to do this but this is a default behavior then this is how how things will be loaded now because we're using this uh, override uh, environment variables flag we're gonna have the environment variables and we're gonna have the system properties then we're gonna have the application.conf which we don't even have yet and uh, we're gonna have application.json we're gonna have application.properties we're gonna have reference.conf and by the way the idea is that libraries will ship with a reference.conf and your application will will ship with applications.conf but there is a problem with this if we go back we see that we did not just say config factory dot load right so we did not use this default overload we said please load some very very specific file and nowhere are we specifying that all the files that happen to be called you know config right so there it's not going to look for config.conf it's not going to look for config.json we're not specifying specifying any of that and yet the values are still merged merged somehow right so we're, we're doing it this this printout you know the different one is the last one right so the last one is for this very very specific you know load this file and again this is one of the reasons why I decided to make this video because some of these loading rules are very very not obvious in fact if we actually go and use parse resources instead of load then we should see that it behaves exactly as it should as I already mentioned this library is very very flexible so it has uh, solutions for most of the problems that well it its own creates right um, yeah so in the end of the, by the end of the video I'm also going to show you an example where parse resources is also not going to help there will be uh, another um, issue related to um, uh, basically to uh, to having multiple files with exactly the same name on different in different parts of the class path and so this parse resources is not going to help because the uh, the merging is not going to happen on, on on this level it's going to happen on the on the class path level okay but we're gonna get to that okay so uh, from now on we're also going to switch to using the dot conf uh, in which we're going to be able to use a uh, hawkon okay so we're gonna go over here and we're going to say that this is going to be called uh, application dot conf like this all right so we're going to go over here and we're going to say value one from application dot conf all right and let's let's see let's see running come on run it okay something is happening okay we need to do it over here as well application dot conf like this what's happening mm -hmm. exception to java long null pointer exception the third one third one is uh, what oh yeah we still we need to do it over there as well mm -hmm. application.conf this one's probably not gonna work because it has no idea how to oh actually look the default system properties also knew how to load application.conf by the way from now on we're actually gonna uh, remove these we don't we don't we don't care about these anymore uh, all of these like this all right so we're only concerned with the type safe config library let's actually go and do that and remove these two all right so basically loading the config getting these two keys out yeah this is this is all we need we actually we can actually call this one properties like this now we're going to play around with hakon in the next video for now we're just basically going to stick to uh, key value pairs also know that uh, vs code has, has actually an extension for hakon uh, to provide better uh, syntax highlighting in fact there are two uh, i use this one and uh, from yan bing zhao um, and uh, it worked fine so i'm just going to install this one all right it's also not perfect in fact like before it actually looked, looked kind of better um i don't i don't know why but uh yeah you can use quotes you can skip quotes we're going to talk about this more in the in the next video okay so it's going to work exactly the same uh let me actually uh close that save again come on run it for me again okay there we go it worked exactly the same we're only going to talk a little bit about Hakun. so for example one of the things that that you can do is you can uh you can go and you can load the values from from the environment right so you can do for example like this um sorry dollar uh dollar key one like this and as of right now it should fail because we're not using load we're actually using dot uh, parse resource uh well it should fail if we actually try to um to load this one right so if we go to key two like this right then it should fail and basically says uh, need config resolve right so basically over here uh we're not 
we're going to do parse resource we're going to do parse resource and then also we're going to say dot uh, dot result but you don't need to do any of that if we're just using you know if you're just using the load okay so if you just go to uh, config uh, get string key two uh, it, it should work right so behind the scenes it's actually doing exactly the same thing right so it's doing parser resources and then it's doing resolve and, and then it also uh, is doing you know with fallback and, and, and things like this but we're going to talk about this a little bit um, a little bit later okay um, again a couple of more things uh, let me actually I removed this one um, and uh, yeah so one, one of the things that you can do is you can do key three equals and we're gonna do like key one and we're also gonna do uh, key one like this right so we're also reading out this one so you can concatenate things you can you know read uh, you know substitute things and you know obviously you have uh, access to the system properties right so you can do like user.home for example right um, and all loaded from dot application dot conf like this all right let's reload and it fails it fails it fails it fails why um unresolved substitution to a value user home 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 there we go home all right problem solved um hmm. i'm actually not happy with this watch because sometimes I would I would prefer it to rerun my stuff every time I save the file but if there are no changes like for example if I'm changing something over here it doesn't actually notice the the change okay it's still not happy why are you not happy what what do you want cannot resolve substitution to a value user dot home and this again happens because we in this case we specifically said please load only this uh, this one file in fact we're going to I'm actually going to comment it out for now and we're gonna switch to config okay config Right. So as you can see, even though, you know, I prepared this video, I'm still uh, sometimes making mistakes because there are like so many ways to to load things and, uh, you know, to to understand things. OK, so let's also do the third one. This is the one that I actually wanted to show you. Uh, let's actually go and run it. So there we go. We see value one from dot NV and value one from system properties and home Vlad all loaded from dot application dot conf. Now, one of the things that um, I don't like about about it and um, I don't like it because it's a little bit inconsistent uh, with itself, so to say. Let me actually revert this one and show it to you. Okay, so let's say that we're only interested in uh, key two, okay? By the way, this is a ZSH thing, I believe, that I can just type in R and then press enter. It will just rerun exactly the same command, right? So, you know, either pressing up and enter or just R, enter. Uh, in any case, all right, so uh, we're, lo we're loading this value, key two equals uh, key one. But if we're doing key two, you know, this environment variable does not exist, okay? We're going to do this. It obviously throws an exception, but if you go down and you define key two again, then it's all good, right? It's all good, right? So basically the, the last value uh, value wins, okay? Now, this is all very interesting, but uh, this is not the confusing part. The confusing part is that you can have uh, multiple configuration files. So if I cut this out, okay, and I'm going to create a file called... Um, called uh, I'm just gonna call it lower.conf right because it's like underneath and I'm just gonna put it over there and when I'm loading over here I will say uh, was fallback fallback uh, config factory dot load uh, lower.conf okay like this all right then it should work right it's exactly the same thing it's underneath but it actually doesn't right it doesn't but if you go over here and if you ju just don't have this value at all it works or if you go over here and you specifically make this value optional it also works right so I find this a little bit inconsistent right because the lower value should be able to override this but only because it's in a separate file um, it, it, it can't and by the way this doesn't have anything uh, special to do with environment variables right so any key that you put it put over here uh, is, is going to behave exactly the same um, in fact there is a solution to this so basically you know uh, this is like one of the things like there are million of millions of ways to load the config but I highly recommend you to stick to the default just always do config factory that load don't do anything else if you wanted to have something else then what I uh, recommend is to control this through the configuration files so for example this fallback you can do this over here and uh, so let's, let's remove this okay so what you can do is you can go over here and you can just say please include a file from the class pass class path in this case and it's going to be called lower.conf okay like this and if we're going to run it it's going to work if we don't have the question mark it is still going to work 
and if we don't have the whole thing it's obviously still going to work right so basically do these fallbacks uh, from uh, from the configuration library and by the way there is also uh, again we're going to talk about this more in the next video but you can also require this file right so for example you can do um, let's actually let me just do that and let's do required um, like this it's basically like a function uh, you know some other right so this one doesn't exist so it should throw an exception okay so um, as you can see uh, do, 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 uh, no configuration se setting found for for key two. really that's that's what you're telling me uh, I thought you would tell me something else hold on let's do this let's do that hmm that's interesting all right hold on let's not do required maybe I messed up this index let's not do required okay no, oh, hmm. That that is probably a bug because uh, you know it behaves correctly, but the error message is weird. All right. So now it says no configuration setting f uh, found for key two. What? Why? In any case, you can demand this file, or uh, you know, or you can make it optional like this. All right. Let me revert that. Um, hmm. Nope. Over here. Run it again. There we go. All right, the next thing that I'm gonna show you is actually uh, more exciting. And this is the one where I uh, originally intended to introduce um, this flag, which was added, um, added much later. So what you can do is you can, um, you can use, well, basically exactly what it says. You can uh, override this environment variables, right? So you can have any value that you have in your in your application.com, for example, for example, this key one, you can go and override it with environment variables without using the environment variables in your configuration files, right? So without doing something like this. For example, we can go and overwrite key one. So what we can do is if we just type in key one, uh, right? So this is a lowercase key one. Uh, we're going to call it, this is, uh, let's actually do a separate key. Let's do key five. Uh, let's do value five uh, from from dot NV. Okay. And let's also press enter so that it's loaded. Okay. So there's the value key five. Uh, let's also do, uh, let's duplicate this one. Let's, uh, let's actually throw these out. We actually don't need them. Okay. So let's do five like this. Okay. Now, if we run this, it's not going to kick in. Okay. So, uh, if we run this, it's, uh, okay. Are we loading key two? Yes. We're still loading key two. Okay. Run this and, uh, maybe we should clean this up a little bit because it's getting, it's getting messy. Okay. So we're doing key one and let's do key five like this. Oh my God. I'm getting surprised again. I actually wanted to show you that by default, this value is not going to override um, this value, but for some magical reason, it actually works out. Let me actually uh, try some, some more complicated value because what I wanted to show you is that you actually have to uh, mangle this key a little bit, uh, but let me actually try something more complicated. Let's do something like this parent dot uh, key six, dash with dashes and um, underscores okay equals uh let's just say value six value six like this all right let me actually go do that that and that let's read it out let's see all right value six from application.conf uh let me actually paste it over here and say uh value six from dot env okay maybe for for such a complicated case uh maybe it's not gonna work okay so it says error invalid line uh because it did not like this right and so for 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 these things um let me actually try something so uh, i'm gonna go and replace every dot which is uh this one only okay every dot was an underscore okay let me actually try that just for fun okay it doesn't work all right uh, and it's still invalid okay just for fun okay so every dash we're going to replace with double underscore okay let's try that okay and every underscore we're going to replace with triple underscore like this and it doesn't uh, hold on interesting okay so now at least it compiles but it doesn't work however if we go and prepend this with config underscore force underscore right so uh with this with this thing config force 
then it should work, I believe. Well, I think it doesn't because it just didn't reload the directory. Okay, yeah, so now if we run it, it, it actually it actually works. All right, so this is actually what I wanted to show you before. I wanted to show you that if you just have key five in your environment, that it is not going to override this, right? But in fact, it does. So I wanted to, to show you that you actually need to use this config force like this, but somehow it is actually not required. Right, so with config force or without config force, if you have like very simple values, it will actually work out somehow. All right, it works out. I didn't know that. I learned something new during the video. All right, and we're gonna see this more in the next video, but basically every time you have a dot, uh, this is basically means that uh, this key is inside of this key. Okay, so basically this thing is exactly, is exactly the same. Okay, so parent, inside of it right so this configuration uh um, you know syntax this format this hawkon it is very uh, prominent in the scala ecosystem and uh, you know tools like scala fmt for example we have a dot conf file which is scala.fmt right it uses exactly the same the same syntax in fact let me actually throw it over here because we have more space over here right this is exactly the same syntax so for example this one new line always before else after curly if you could also say new lines dot always before else after curly if all right. Now, I highly encourage you to uh, to use uh, this um, uh, this flag. In fact, I always use it. In fact, if we go into into my uh, my dot profile, you will see that by default, I'm exporting a very interesting environment variable. There is this environment variable called uh, Java Tool Options, right? There is also Java Ops, uh, but um, uh, Java tool options is the one that is being picked up by by Bloop, right? So Java ops is not okay, which is why I'm always exporting this environment variable. And this is a funky environment variable because the content of the environment variable are system properties, right? So and and one of them is this one. Now this is also the reason why we're not we're not seeing it is because at the bottom of my dot profile I also have uh, please also load dot local dot profile and in there at least on this virtual machine which I'm using for recording my videos I actually disabled it. Okay, so if I go into dot local uh, dot profile, you're gonna see that I'm un unsetting it. And only for this video, I'm gonna you know disable it again after after I'm done. I'm going to actually remove this. In fact, I'm actually going to remove the entire file because I don't need it. Dot profile. Okay, so now if I log out, log out, and by the way, this logging out and logging back in sometimes doesn't work. I don't know why, like sometimes I actually had, had to reboot the, the entire virtual machine, uh, but I believe that this is um, uh, maybe a virtual uh, machine issue. Um, I don't know. So for example, uh, if I open my terminal now, once it actually uh, finishes loading, and I will say, you know, echo Java tool options, there's a chance that it will still show me nothing, right? So if I do, uh, hold on, uh, echo uh, Java tool options, right? It still show me, shows me nothing. However, if I close the terminal, open it again, all of a sudden they're there. I have no idea why. And sometimes they actually don't appear. In any case, they're now there, which means that if we start something like Ammonide, we're always going to see this picked up Java tool options, right? So it's always printed out. This is a, uh, you know, this is a feature. This is not a bug. And this is also the reason why I don't want to use it in my videos because, you know, I don't want this to be, to be shown every time. Okay, so uh, let's go into the config playground. Yes, this one, let's open it with Visual Studio Code like this, same as before. All right, uh, but now we're gonna have exactly the same be behavior uh, without uh, specifying this flag, stop jumping around. So if we go and do the same uh, bloop thing, oh, come on. All right, so we actually don't need this variable anymore and everything will still work. And this is also probably why, because you know, because I had it in my system properties, this is also why I was, um, uh, surprised why uh, why the environment variables weren't weren't loaded without this flag because I probably had this flag and I just didn't even notice okay and I've had it there for years so uh, well not for years it's been introduced like only half a year ago but you know you get the point okay so they're always printed out the SPT picks them up blue picks them up everything picks them up and uh, as you can see uh, it, it, it works right so the environment variables loaded everything is loaded perfect one thing to know um, about them is uh, look if I start Ammonite it picks it picks them up okay so if I um, have if I do some like Java tool options over here and I'm going to add add something in there right so for example if I do hyphen xx plus use concurrent mark sweep 
GC. And I'm, I'm picking this one on purpose, okay? I'm picking this one on purpose uh, because I know that it will col collide with ammonite. And this is exactly why, uh, why I showed it to you, right? So basically, I just want to show it to you. So be careful what you're adding uh, into your dot profile uh, because now, if, uh, I mean, right now that I added it here, it only doesn't work from, from this folder. However, if I open another folder, Right, for example, I'm in my home directory. I still can start uh, Ammonite, right? Because by default, I'm not uh, I'm not using this conflicting flag. Okay, I just wanted to show it to you, you know, in case you want to have a, a similar setup. Um, this particular flag collides with Ammonite. All right, let's do this. Press Enter, Ammonite, and now it loads uh, loads properly. All right, let's go back to our bloop like this. All right, so now we can have our 12 factor apps, right? So we can override anything we want, you know, with with the environment variables. However, we kind of lose the convenience of this of this nice little format, and it turns out that we can have our cake and eat it too. If you stick to using only config factory load, in fact, uh, this can be and the lines can be joined over here. If you stick to only uh, you know load, right? So if you don't uh, load your resources yourself, you know with like parse resource or like from file or whatever the overloads are called. If you stick to this one, then um, the library allows you to specify yet another system property, which will override all of your defaults and all of your application.conf files. So for example, uh, we could go and create a file. Uh, let's go and create a file. And I'm gonna create it, I don't know, somewhere in my home folder, uh, like this, click, 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 click. So I'm just gonna go and call it global.conf, right? It doesn't need to be called like this, it just needs to be, you know, .conf, which I saved in the wrong destination. Man, I chose this um, this model uh, on purpose, right? So there's a setting in VS Code that uh, doesn't pop up with the uh, uh, with the operating system default dialog, but it pops up with this. So let me just actually do that. Homelab.global.conf, like this, all right? So uh, now if we go over here and do something like, what are we doing here? Um, yeah, yeah, let's do, let's take these two, okay? So we go over here and we're gonna say that this is going to be dot global dot conf right i called it like this because because i wanted to call it like this all right so now if we're going to uh run the same command we can actually also go and say hyphen j hyphen j hyphen d and now we can say config config dot file and there's also you know there's also url and there's also um uh um uh, class path, I believe you can basically go and, and and just override this entire thing, right? So you can just say equals, and you can go and say home, home, come on, home slash vlad slash dot global dot conf like this. All right, now in our case, this is actually still not visible because um, we have polluted everything. Okay, so let's have key one over here. Uh, let's have um, key one over here, and let's have key one over here and let's also just load these two okay so um actually let me press enter real quick okay like this okay so uh we're loading um value one from down in v uh we're loading the key one from system properties right so this is the one that is that is coming from here but let's actually go and have uh key two this is the two and this is the two um no, this is the two and this is the two. And let's have exactly the same thing over here. The two and this is the two, okay? So this is the one that should now be loaded from the uh, global.conf and not from the application.conf uh, because we specified this flag, right? So we said uh, config file global.conf and now it actually goes to this file and it doesn't even take anything from application.conf, right? So for example, if we have a value in application.conf called uh, key three, but we don't have it in global.conf, right? It's not gonna automatically fall back to application.conf, right? So it's actually gonna explode and it's gonna say, hey, it's not there. It's gonna say, hey, key three was not there, right? And then again, you can do the same trick as I showed you before, you know, you can go and, and do your fallback. You can do it either here or you can do it over here, right? So you can say uh, include and you can also say required, uh, you know, like this is this is what I would usually do, right? So I would say include, well, not, not, not the required, I would say include uh, file, uh, it's actually not file, it's class path, class path, but it could have been file, it could have been URL as well, okay? Uh, application.conf, okay? Let's see if I made any typos, and it looks like I didn't, okay? So now it loads one from here and, and the other one from uh, from there. Uh, in fact, oh yeah, look, because we because we included the application.conf, uh, now 
this key two actually overrides it. So what you what you should do is you should have it at the top. Okay, so now it's gonna uh, behave exactly like you want. Okay, so the, the global conf has precedence. Uh, so, so you have your environment variables, you have your system properties, global conf, and then only if something is missing, you're gonna have the application.conf, right? But you kind of have to specify it before because everything that comes after has precedence. So now it's really cool, right? So you can have your environment variables, you can override everything with your environment vari variables if you want to have like this really, really uh, fine grained control. However, you can also still keep using the Hawkon syntax. You know, you can have like your local uh, file, you can, you can add it to git ignore and then basically instead of you know specifying everything with this environment variable, environment variable syntax which is very constrained you can actually go and say you know I don't care where you're loading I'm just going to replace everything with this one dot cont file okay and this is what I usually do actually so yeah so uh, this is how I usually load it just with this with this one but there are so many overloads like for example let me show you one actually right so for example you can say instead of load let me just say parse string parse string and inside of it you can use Hawkon and in the next video we're gonna uh, talk exactly about the syntax right but you can do a foo bar and over here you can just say you know just show me the foo okay like this right so we're gonna run it and it loads the bar right many ways but you know I stick to the defaults uh, it works for me um, you know I don't have to uh, you know break my head about you know uh, you know all the all the presence rules all the, all the resolution rules because I'm always just sticking to the defaults in general This is a good practice, you know, like the, the less fancy you go the better All right, we're pretty much done with the video I'm gonna show you only a couple of things before I leave uh, one of them is a is a bug that is currently in in bloop because and it's, it is related to uh, To loading things from class pass, which is in general a very noble endeavor uh, But it is very dangerous in fact. I went ahead and and, and I reproduced it. So if we go um into my uh, dev folder over here and I'm gonna uh, clone it from from my github page you can you can go and check it out but probably by the time that you're watching this video uh, this bug is probably already resolved okay so if I open this with with Visual Studio Code okay and uh, once it wakes up we're going to import the build uh, no I don't want this now go away some plugin okay import the build all right, so we have a very very simple project, right? So we have uh, we have A and B, and you know we have two two sub modules, right? We have A and B, and B depends on A, okay? And B also uses the the config library, okay? So B is B is lower. In A, we have the application.conf, which basically does full bar, right? And and says blue loads this one, and in B, we have we have a similar one, right? But uh, we're saying SBT loads this one, okay? Now because they're both on on the class path, man, I hate that everything is jumping around because you know like things that you know the files are being generated and so on, all right? Now um, because both of them are on the class path, if we're going to run the main, which is in B, which basically just you know just loads full bar, stop jumping around, Jesus Christ, all right? So if we if we just want to load full bar, then we're gonna get uh, different results from SBT and from Blue. Okay, so if we, if we, for example, do SPT B run, we're going to see uh, the proper behavior. We're going to see this one, right? Because it's it's lower on the class path and therefore it overrides the other one, right? So it's so once it uh, finishes uh, loading and compiling, it's going to say SBT loads this one. However, if we're going to run exactly the same code with Bloop, right, without changing anything, we're going to run with Bloop. It's going to load the other one, right? So if we do Bloop run B, it's going to say Bloop loads this one. Okay, this is a funny, funny thing because um, a Bloop actually also loads both of them. It just said the resolution mechanism is different. So if I go to A, right, and I go and do something like um, key one equals value one like this, and I go back to main, okay, and I do uh, key one, okay, key one, okay, and I'm going to run this with Bloop again. It will actually see, you know, it will actually see this value. So it sees the value over there but uh, somehow it doesn't see this one. In fact, uh, let's actually go and add it over here, right? Value one, um, let's do in B, okay? Like this, right? It just doesn't see this somehow. I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird. And this is exactly what I meant earlier, right? So if, even if you go and say, you know, parse, uh, parse resources and say application.conf, and you do resolve, right? It's still not going to help because this is an unrelated bug, right? So it still says Bloop loads this one value one, uh, but SBT SBT loads uh, loads the other one, right? Which is a bit crazy, but again, uh, probably by the time that you're watching this, this bug is going to be resolved. The point of this is basically, you know, always write a unit test. Uh, in fact, like this this particular thing is not so easy to test with your you know with your unit test because um, because then you know in um, 
you know in production you're gonna you know you're gonna run with some some other values that your unit tests don't don't cover so uh so yeah just in general uh this is a very important topic which is why i made this very very insanely long video uh just dedicated to loading the conflict because usually when you're looking um when, when you're uh, watching tutorials about the conflict library they show you, you know the hawk you know the the, spe the the specification because it's fun to work with and it's kind of cool that you can specify whatever the hell you want you know the syntax is very pleasant but this is actually way way more important and i see it being wrong way too many times all right let's actually go and close this one and um uh yeah so another thing that uh, that you can do is you can go and specify your environment variables in your build file but i, I, ha I have to be honest i haven't played around with it but basically you can do some like in v vars you know plus plus equals sequence and, you know you specify them uh it's it's a map by the way right so you can do um so you can do map uh you know uh, key one um key one uh you one and whatever right and you can do the same thing for java ops right so you can do java java options you know plus plus equals uh sequence okay and over here you can do your half j you know blah 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 half d and all of that stuff uh, i've never used them I, I i find them weird um so uh yeah not now okay but just so you know it is also possible a couple of more things you can always see where your values come from so for example you can go and say uh print line config dot origin i believe all right, let's go and run it. And it's going to say uh, merge of environment variables, override system properties and a global.conf. Uh, what you can also do is, uh, for example, if you have something like, uh, pa, 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 let's have a uh, parent and then we're gonna have foo, uh, foo equals bar like this. Then what you can do is you can print line config dot get config parent, right? And you can say dot origin. Right, so basically, you can you can get like a, a subtree uh, from from the config, and it will be um, uh, it will behave exactly the same as, as an entire config, right? So in this case, it says, okay, I'm coming from application.conf, uh, which is which is over there, which is really really um, convenient. One of the the things to know is that you can't go for keys, right? So this has to be like these. Uh, they're called uh, I believe I believe they're called objects, okay? So if you just do like key one, it's gonna explode. Okay, so you can only, um, you know, it has to be a config or like, or, or like sub part of a config. It can't be a key, right? So it's going to say uh, key one has to have string rather than, than type object. Okay, so basically it expected an, an object. Okay, uh, another thing that you can do is you can uh, print out uh, something like this, right? So this is going to print out the entire config where it loaded from blah, 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 the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. You can also do exactly the same thing for... Um, for this uh for this other thing right so you can do config dot uh get config parent okay and then do root render and it will uh you know it will render only uh this tiny part get config like this right so now it will render only only this tiny part right one last thing that i'm going to show you is that there's also another system property that you can use to uh, basically to debug your config right so without like changing your code you can just go and say d config dot uh, trace equals loads okay and now uh, it will uh, print out the entire config it looks like it's printing uh, printing it out to the error uh, error stream uh, but uh, but it works right so it's, it's it's doing that on purpose okay so it says loaded config file from here and you know you see all the system properties you know like this hugely long one for example um, and this one okay it's not a long one it's a bunch of different ones os name linux blah 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 all of that all of that stuff yeah that's pretty much all i wanted to show you today uh please don't skip the next video it's going to be way more fun actually than this one this one was kind of annoying actually uh but in the in the other one we're going to learn about hawkon we're going to learn about how to uh, read the values out of this you know once they're loaded how to how to read them properly because for now all we have been doing was you know get string right which is kind of boring also we're going to talk about config validation and um also about a library called um pure config which is a sort of like a replacement that can uh load um the same uh, hawkon um, specification for you. For now, as always, it's been Vlad, DiamondsideU.com. Don't forget to like this video if you did, subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you, and if you learned something today, consider supporting me on Patreon, and most importantly, take care.